first of all, let me thank you for your time. I always respect people's time and try to make it as fruitful for you as the drive over here was. Some of you would have just run out the school, gone straight to the car and got here. I also want to acknowledge my supervisors of my PhD. So uh, Associate Professor Terry de Jong, who has now since passed away, was a wonderful man, and uh, Professor Lynn Cohen, who guided me through this. So. This is based on my research that I worked with young people who had been through risk and I asked them what helped you get over it. And from that, I've spoken to probably 4,000 people now on this topic. I've just finished writing a book on practical strategies. As I worked as a psychologist, I put these things in practice and they worked amazing. So if I can encourage you with my first point is, if you want to make change in your school, go and ask the people who need the change. Because so often what we do is we go, oh, I've got this great program and I'm going to do a social skills and I'm going to do this. And, you know, when you go talk to the kids, say, what do you need? What do you want me to do for you? It's so powerful. So when I was working with young people in, um, as a school psych and I would say, oh, what about, you know, what do you need? And I would do it. And the, the teachers would be like, wow, like you've transformed that child. And I thought, I'm not actually that clever. I just asked them and I just did what they asked me to do. So they're a great tool. And I think sometimes we miss them from the equation. Uh, so, overview is, um, you can see my notes have got more messy as the day goes on. Happy to email my notes too if anyone would like these at the end, just um, you can find me. What I try to do when I do resilience, I usually do this in about two hours or a day, so 45 minutes is challenging. Has anyone been to one I did three years ago? Alright, so I've tried to make it quite different from that for the two people that were there. <laughs> we had about 400 from that time I had, um, I had sick like pharyngitis and I was like, had codrill and I was like hanging off the, like, the whiteboard trying to talk, but we had a good time, didn't we? So I try to make it about you so that you are resilient because I think as teachers, you know, I know that I would struggle going back into your job. I take my hat off to you. I don't speak like everywhere I go. I push teachers. I say they're awesome. They're doing an amazing job because I think you need to be resilient to help young people be resilient. But I also think in our everyday lives, we also, there's so many things we could do better. I have never met anybody ever who has had a, done terrible things, been awful because they want to be. Like everyone I've met, if you just tweak something, if you just solved a need, like I could see that they could actually have a better outcome. So sometimes it's just being a little bit of, um, I call it a treasure hunter. You look for the good and a bit of an investigator. Find out what's going on, what can I change here? And sometimes with ourselves, we can be really harsh on ourselves. And so some of the things I'm going to say to you today is like, I want you to think about yourself. I want you to think, how does this challenge me? How am I like pulling myself down when I actually need to be thinking more positive thoughts? All right, so resilience is doing better than expected. And um, I chose this topic mostly because Lynn Cohen suggested I do it. But I came from single family home, quite like a lot of poverty, uh, three, two brothers, a brother and sister. And people always said to me, how come you've made it? How come you are where you are? And I'd be like, no, I don't know. And so the whole time I'd ask that question and then I'd see young people, because I worked in Garraween most of my teaching career, and I'd see kids that were making it and I'd think, why are you making it for? So it's just this like magic thing that we kind of look at. What have I got? I'm not really into slides, so. I'm not going to use them a great deal. See all the notes I've got on that slide? Like, write that down. So it's having better than expected outcomes. So let's just say you fail a test and instead of, you know, crumpling into a ball on the floor and crying for the next six months, and I've never done that, it's actually getting up saying, I'll study harder, I'm not going to quit the course, I'm going to step up and move on. But resilience, I want to make very clear today, is not about perfect outcomes. And I am, um, if you did hear me on Monday night with um, Jeff Hutchison, which about happiness, there's this sort of thing out there where we've got to be great all the time. And like a good life is one where you're always happy, where everything's going right. And I think it's going to be very damaging to some of the kids in this generation. Because as soon as something goes wrong, there's this thought that I'm not good enough. My life's out of control. Da, da, da. But seriously, like I meet lots of people, and as a psychologist, lots of people tell me about their life. I have never met anyone with a perfect life. And people could have come across and you think, well, they've got a perfect life. Let me tell you, no, everyone, people that just, they hide it better than others. So for resilience, it's just doing better than expected, but it's not a perfect life. That's slide one, so I'm not like going fast enough, am I? 
All right, so why are some people more resilient than others? There's a big fascination. We can believe that there's these super-powered people out there that they just have it, and I just don't have it. And there's some kids in my class, and they just have it, and they just don't have it. And that is not true either. What we have, and I use this with my students, it's a bucket. So if you imagine, I have a bucket here, and through my life, I go through my life, and people put things in my bucket. So when I was growing up, my mum loved me unconditionally. She put that in my bucket. Not every kid has that in their bucket. And I, I know lots of people that actually flinch when I talk about my mother because uh, they don't have that. My mother put no homework in my bucket. I never did any schoolwork. She didn't really care about that. That was not in my bucket. I didn't learn to read till I was in year three or four, but not because mum didn't care. It just wasn't in my bucket. Um, I had lots of extended family. I had, I had, I had. I had lots of things in my bucket. So when people say, why did you do well? I look in there and I go, I had all those things. When I see resilient people, what I know is that they've got that stuff in their bucket. And what my job I see now is to tell people what those things are and to help you have them. So it's, it's like this mystical thing at the moment, like, you know, what's it going to be? Why are you resilient? And I'm, gonna, I'm going too slow already. So we look at things like, oh yeah, if you've got good social competence, you'll be resilient. That's not true. If you win, you know, academic, you'll be resilient. That's not true. And if you are optimistic and hope, and I can give you 20 more of these things. These things have a correlation. So yes, resilience is related to these things, but they are not the cause of resilience. And what we try to do with students is we teach them these things and hope that they become resilient. But it doesn't work. And I'll explain why it doesn't work. I'm not saying don't do it. I just want you to know why you're going to do it and when it might be useful. The problem is, and I can see this when I was teaching, is, and you would see this when you're teaching as well, is I would see students with these things and they don't use them. Yes? So I would run a social skills class and then I would see them all like snatching stuff and like, like you're stupid and you know, no thank you, no, you know. I'm like, what happened to my class I just ran then? So these things are good, but we need a motivation to use them. So that's what my challenge was. When I interviewed the young people, I was like, why, are, why did you choose to get better? When you were going through the difficult, why did you make that choice? Come here, it's all good. I like being distracted, don't I? It actually helps me. So we're not giving people skills and doing anything else. We're not changing the way they think about themselves. We're just saying, here's a skill. Now what happens when you just have a skill is that Let's just say that you have given me the skill and you've given me my social confidence and you've given me that, but I'm like, you know what? I just don't really care. I'm just not that interested. And I know you said I can be motivated and I can learn, I can go to the after school homework club, but I just don't care. So that's number one. We can give it all they want, but they're not actually gonna do it. But then the other thing is these also do matter at the same time because you know, if you've got a child who doesn't have the skills, if they do care, they can't make that decision to move on. So what you need is the reason to use a skill and the skill. And at the moment, a lot of what we're doing is giving them the skills, but not the reason. What is the reason? Number one is changing our beliefs about ourselves. Now, this came through over and over and over and over again. And I did not want this word to come. I did grounded theory. If you're interested in doing research, you know, come and talk to us. Grounded theory is developing a theory from the ground up. I wanted to see what just young people said. And they said to me over and over again, when my life was worth something, then I changed it. And, you know, as I've gone through the last, so that was eight years ago I finished, I have heard that so many times. I heard people on... Oprah saying, why did you keep the weight off? And just, the lady stood up and said, when I decided I was worth something. I saw this guy in um, prison they were interviewing. He killed his family. Why did you do this? He said, because I was worthless and I didn't care anymore. Girl got up on stage at church the other day, gave her, talked about her life, how she was into drinking and stuff. And she said, I changed my life when I decided I was worth something. So it's this revelation that my life has value, so I will invest in it. And I, I think about it like an old rundown car, you know, like this old, you know, I, Ford Festiva, like, sorry if you have one. 
It's like, they're not like collector's edition or anything. I usually pick Hyundai because that's my worst car ever, but they're, they're probably better now. But we're not going to put 20, 30,000 into that car, are we? Because it's not worth anything to us. But if you had this like old, you know, 19, I don't even know, I should pick cars better, 60s Jaguar, like a really collector's edition, you would invest into that car. It's worth something. And kids say the same thing to me. When I did therapy with kids, I would basically push them into that place where they believed they were worth something. And I'll show you how I do that. And then I'll bring in, like the focus for today is um, gonna be coping. I, um, where's Madeline? I canceled my class too, so Aww. I don't have to run away. <laughs> I did have another class, so I was gonna like talk and then, but I can, wait. All right, so we need to change our beliefs about ourselves and we need to give kids the skills that they need. So self-worth. Self-worth is believing your life has a value and what we have to do is input it. Now, these are the things that my research showed and these come up in lots of other people's research too that give life value. Now, these are stable and unconditional. So it's not like one day I feel special and the next day I don't feel like my life has value. The more I get to know this, the more I understand that you have to have the belief yourself. You have to decide my life has value. So let's just say Julie says that I'm worthless today, which she wouldn't because she likes me, but that's conditional. Then my whole worth wouldn't go, oh, because I have to hold the belief myself. I can't be subject to everyone else's understanding of me. Unconditional signs of worth, and I will explain them. I wanted to draw a picture, but I can't. Let me just show you with my finger. I draw a circle. So I have told this story before, but it's, it's, a, it's a very important story. So one school, I had year seven boys quite a lot in therapy where, you know, like punching people, you know how you get that kind of testosterone thing going on, a bit of family conflict. So this one boy came in and his parents had separated and he was very angry and he had just going out at lunchtime, just like, bam, and they'd be like, wait, why'd you do it? I don't know. So he's sitting there um, with his parents, he'd been brought in, and I'm sitting there and he goes, I don't want to see a psych. And he's like this, like, nobody wants to see me anymore. I was, had much more friends when I was a teacher. So I, um, you should see when I used to do relief, like everyone would sit with me and now when I go into the site, they're all <laughs> down the other end of the, I was like, I don't take it personally at all. So he's like, I don't want to do psych. And so he was really mad. So I drew a circle on, I always have paper. If, you talk, if you're working with kids, just roll out paper, give them some pencils, let them draw. Don't just stare at them in the eye and go, tell me what's wrong with you. So I drew the circle and I colored in almost, almost all the circle. I said, see that colored in bit, that whole thing is your life. That colored in bit is all the bad things that you're doing at the moment. I'm very honest with students and children, adults. And he said, yes. And I said, you know, he stole all the fundraising money. You know, he was punching people. There's so many things. And he's like, yeah. And I said, see that white bit that I haven't colored in? I said, that's the good part about you. And that's why I say, you've got to be a treasure hunter. Do it with yourself. Do it with your friends. Do it with the kids that you work with. And he said, and I get this every single time when kids have lost hope and they're just totally self-destructive. He said, there's nothing good about me. And I said to him, yes, there is. And again, I spend my time, I get up in the morning and I say to myself, I'm going to go find good things about people. I literally do say that. And I go around and I look for where people have done well because that's my focus. So I could point to him three or four things because I used to go play out in the playground with the year sevens a bit when I was school psych. They said they hadn't seen that before. And I was like, oh, it's awesome. And just like, it's much more fun. So I said to him that, and I said, do you know what my job is as a school psych? I said, it's to find, to push back that scribble, to find the good in you again. And he, do, they do this every time. I just love it. He sits up, unfolds his arms, and he looks at me, and he says to me, can you really do that? I say, yes, I can. And he said, all right, I'm in. So from this kid, he didn't want to talk to me at all. Because people want to be valued, right? As a core part of our humanness is that we need to feel like our life has value. Not that we're awesome, but I'm so cool. It's like just deep down this need to feel a value. So then I go through a process and I take them through these things here, which I'm going to do quickly with you, and watch them change miraculously. And I mean miraculously. So one of the other boys that I did this with, sat down with him, he had been like expelled, suspended for the whole seven years. So I got him first term, year seven, 
and I sat down with him and I said the same conversation with him. And again, you've got to be genuine. It's not like a formula. And in fourth term, beginning of fourth term, he comes running into me and he goes, I was like, what's going on? What's going on? And he goes, oh, you'll never guess what's happened. And I was like, what's happened? And he said, I got Aussie of the month. And I'm like, oh, you know, the, it literally. And then the parents rang me two years later when I was here and said, you would not believe how well our son's doing now. That moment where you think, you know what, this life is worth investing in. I know I've got all those skills and those people that want to help me. I'll let them help me. And I would do it for myself as well. So let's have a look. Normally I would let you. I've written like 12 times as much as I'm saying. So again, if you want my slides or my book, feel free. All right, so social media. I, I am the actually, I'm having a go at it a lot in the last few weeks. I am super concerned with the fact that we display this self on social media and we all suck it in. You know, I actually turned off Facebook, I like, what do you call it? Like, turned it off, like where you'd not deactivated it. Because it was bothering me. And I think, far out, I'm the one who's meant to be resilient and I know all this stuff. And it was really getting on my annoyance that other people seem to have much better lives than I did. <laughs> and I'm like, seriously, you know the truth. Stop it. But our young people aren't at all. We're mature. We can step back from that and go, oh, look what I'm doing. I'm going to deactivate that a while and actually go see real people. They get their worth from the number of likes, from the number of friends on Insta or Snapchat or whatever the newest platform is. You know, I saw a girl who went uh, posting something on Sahara, like where you just all comment on people. And I, her mum said she was writing her own comments on her page. Such and such is beautiful. How hot is such and such? That is a desperate search for worth in a wrong place. And what it is, it leaves you with a very, the kids in my research, it's beautiful, they said it leaves you hollow and, and it doesn't fulfill your need. So one of the girls in my research said, you know, I went and got the new um, nail polish that I desperately needed and I felt really empty at the end of it. And that's what wrong worth gives you. When you go after it, you get this thrill, like when I bought my handbag, I was very excited for about a minute and a half and then it's gone. So we look for those sort of things, and then adults, we look for these. Now, I'm not saying any of these are wrong. I'm just saying if they're your core, they are wrong. They are, you know what, like at the moment, I, am, I get to speak on the radio, I get to work here, I get to speak to you, I get to do lots of really awesome things. If they got, if I lost my job tomorrow, it had to be like really bad here. Um, if I didn't get to be on the radio, if I didn't like the show anymore, I don't care. Like, I literally do not care because my number one goal is to help people. And I can do that anywhere. I'd like to work at Maya personally because they wear makeup and really cool clothes and stuff. Mum reckons I'd be over it in about a day, but we'll see. But it's about like that you're not reliant. Like if my hair or whatever appearance is not perfect, then my world doesn't come down. What do you stake your worth in? And kids, I did um, some stuff in, in Lou, near one of the primary schools in that suburb. A uh, really difficult group of year sixes. I did four sessions with them and it was literally transformational. Teaching them about your worth, you know, is these, not these. These things are cool, it's great. I said to one to them, it's great to have the new Nikes or whatever. And one of the boys in the class said, but when you take the Nikes off, they're not you anymore, are they? I was like, aren't kids profound? I love, all right, so time for tips. These are things I've tried, they work. It's already nearly half past, we're going. All right, so I started this about a year and a half ago, just in a conversation with someone, and it's been quite amazing the way it's worked. And it's probably there in other people's work, it's just something that I've developed um, in my own words. All right, so there's me, and there's inner space, and the blue ones are outer space. So about a year or two into this job, we get at unit evaluations and there's lovely people like Claire and other ones. I got some, how many students do I have here at the moment? I've got a few, haven't I? Hey, I got some great students here and I get some nice comments, but I get some really mean ones. And sometimes it would hurt me for like about a month. So it would really have a big impact on me. And I'd be thinking, oh, what is wrong with me that I'm so affected by those students' comments when really they probably didn't like their mark on their assignment or whatever it is. And when I add it up, because I do a lot of work with my church, I do a lot of community stuff, I probably come into contact with about 2,000 people a week. So I was thinking, 
do you really expect all of those 2,000 people to like you? And I was like, yes, I do. I was like, <laughs> I was like I'm honest with myself. And I was like, you're ridiculous. And I've done this with kids. And I said, do you really think? And I put like fake name. I put like the gardener. So the gardener doesn't like your hair. And the girls are like, I don't care. But they've got 700 Facebook friends that they want everyone to like them. So what I encourage kids to do is to pick a new five normally. I don't know why I pick six here. People that are your inner space. So inner space are the stable people. Because remember, worth has to be stable. Don't rely on people that aren't stable. If you put those people in there, you can tell them stuff, you can share stuff. And these people have a voice in your life. They can tell you stuff about you. So my mum can say to me, do you know what? You're being really annoying today. And I'll be like, okay, fair call. And I take it on. So not that she would ever say that because I'm her favorite child, so. <laughs> now out here is outer space. And as I said, like I come into contact with a lot of people. And what I was doing was giving these people a voice, every single one of them. And I, I got confused because I was like, how do I be in that space and be with those people and actually not get hurt and discouraged by those people? And it works really well because in my head, now I think, so when someone comes up to me and goes, oh, you are like, so stupid. And I, in my head, I'm like, I don't say it out loud. I say, you're out of space. Like, <laughs> it actually doesn't bother me anymore. I'm like, I exist with you. I can have coffee with you. You're a nice enough person, but you don't get a voice. And so you've got to decide who gets to speak into your life. And children make this decision really well. And you might, I think they sometimes say the five people on your hand or something like that. But I find for this, like, also, I have people in my family, so my family life is not perfect. So there's a family member who's currently in outer space. <laughs> and he may go back into inner space, but not at the moment. But I caught up with him on the weekend and I had a lovely time with him. But he doesn't have a voice at the moment. So I can spend time with people and I find it, it's very much more supportive for me than it is. All right, the other thing that I want to teach you to do and people to do is to be a connector. We often come in and we, we expect people to sort of, you know, beehive around us and to make friends like something. But I tell my students is go and find the people that you want in your world and make them part of your world. So when I'm at work, I go and pick the people that I like. And just about this whole front row is the people that I like. And more people than the front row. It's not, don't worry, I've got more friends than that. <laughs> but I'm very conscious, back row, yes, there's one up near the camera too. I'm very conscious about who I invest in. So I am very choosy about who I connect with. And I connect with people that, I mean, I connect with a lot of people because I like encouraging and helping and supporting people as well. But I, I connect with people that I like who they are. And then I get that into my world as well. So encourage kids to connect, to make that decision. And I say to them when they're going to high school, because do lots of transition programs with kids, is find the teacher that you like, connect with them, be nice to them, say thanks, go up and say, you know, good job today. Like, don't be like, you know, crawling to them or anything, but, you know, find the kids that are nice, connect with those kids, like keep, get them to be proactive. We are not a victim of our friendships. We don't just have to like fall into wherever we're going. All right, one more thing with relationships. All right, so I got a message from a teacher that used to be at a school I was at, and uh, she said, oh, no, it was many, many years ago that she was at the school that I was at, so don't try and work it out. I know, I always have to think, what am I sharing here? She's like, oh, I, you know, I tried to, you know, I'm at this new school and nobody likes me and I'm just not getting on with anyone and what's wrong with them? It's like deathly crickets. <laughs> So I've spent a lot of time with this person, trying to encourage them to have some new strategies. And I try, I think what we have to do is, with ourselves and with students, is be responsible. And I feel like that's missing at the moment. It's like, is this like, it's everyone else, it's not me. And teach your students, and again, kids are great at picking this up, is that when you take responsibility for what is yours, not everything is yours though, then you can change things. If you take responsibility for everything, you can't change everything. You need to pick out what is actually your thing and then go out there and do something about it. So you teach children that there are things that you can do and um, maybe work out with them in a problem-solving way what that can be.
All right, last thing. I'm just adding more. I've only got eight pages to... No, not really. I don't. Uh, I'll go over this quickly because there's only two people. I just didn't put this in. So you need to also give them a good model of a relationship. And for me, it's genuine love that you give kids. And if you have time, read Gary Chapman's Five Languages of Love, one of the best books on understanding how to make other people feel love. Gary Chapman, awesome book. But basically, we all feel loved in different ways. And you can make every child in your class and every teacher around you feel loved by tuning in to how they feel loved. So words of affirmation, saying nice things, writing a note. I used to hide little notes in their desks. I only worked with the Year 7s a day or so a week. So when they came back into school on the Monday, they'd open their desk and there'd be like this cool note there about why I think they're awesome. Um, send a letter home to the, you know, a note home to the family. By, I just gave my class then mini chopper chops. They were like, yes. So I gave them a gift. So gifts are other ways. Um, a pat on the shoulder, a high five, physical touch. There's lots of ways we can show kids. Quality time. Who has that child that follows them around the room? <laughs> or who, if you're in junior primary, who has 25 children that follow you? Far out. That's like a full-on job. I did that for two years. I, that's like, I salute. I said to my junior primary class one day, oh, I said to my principal after two weeks, I said, I don't want to do this anymore. Can I go back to year seven? And he's like, no, you can't just give the class back. You know, they were year two. And then at news, they all had a, once you mentioned the word dog, they all had their hand up with a dog story. And I was like, all right, how about you line up at recess so you could all tell me your story then? They all lined up, like the whole recess, <laughs> to tell, and like into recess, and they're still happy to stand there waiting for the story. So I was like, okay. If you can be that one person, research shows one person that shows unconditional love is enough to shift a person. You could be that one person. And you know, if you show unconditional love and regard, I'm using love, but it's like care, kindness. If you show that to the other teachers around you, you, can, you create a community that is feeding each other instead of pulling each other down. And that's what we want to do is work on developing. And I said to my, I say to my students here, I said, don't think you don't add something to the system. Don't think if you're all quiet and you go to work and you're like, I'm saying to myself today, I'm just going to go sit in my office and I'm just going to teach my class and I'm just not going to, just, just not going to do anything. Don't think you're not adding something negative. You are. You're adding something. You're always adding something. And you've got to decide, what am I going to add? Is it going to be a positive thing or is it going to be more challenging or am I going to withdraw? And I have to say, be honest, I've done it. I've withdrawn. I've gone to workplaces and thought, no, I don't want to be friends with anyone. I'm just going to go do my own thing. And then I put my big girl's pants on. That's what I say to myself and grew up a little bit. All right, purpose is on this slide too because I'm trying to go through fast. So purpose, the kids, every single one of the students I interviewed, uh, participants really, they all said that helping others was going to be their career in the future. And they also said that was how they got better. And there's so much research that shows even like at the biological level, when we reach out and help other people, there's actually a physical change in our body. Now the thing with purpose is, and I love helping people, is you can't take it away. So it's stable. I can't change this. Like once I've helped someone, you can't make me feel like unhappy about it. And so setting up a school where you are intertwined in supporting one another is an amazing thing to create that system. And if you can't do that, I used to do this with my class. You know, I'd say, hey, guess what everyone? So when I was in primary school, not here is, um, you know, Mrs. such and such, you know, had, you know, her dog died this week and, you know, clearly I already knew I'm not sharing personal information that I shouldn't be. And I'd be like, what do you think we could do? And they'd be like, oh, we could write her a note or something. I was like, great idea. Let's do that. Uh, sometimes on Friday afternoons, I'd send sticky notes stapled with a child to another teacher, like an encouraging, and the kids knew what, it was an encouraging note. And then that teacher would send them around with other, you know, and these notes would go around. So you're modeling and showing them that this is how I think about how I go into the world. The thing with purpose is, which is opposite to what we're seeing in this uh, online world, is it's not self-focused. It's also another problem I have with programs. Programs are very, so I'm going to be like fighting programs till I finish my career, I think. I'm not actually completely against programs. I just think people put them in and go, yes, I've done, fixed it. And it's not true. Programs look at my self-confidence, my self-esteem, me, me, me. I'm going to draw the things that make me happy and how I go. I'm just like, okay, absolutely. You should look at yourself. You should reflect. 
But I think the more self-focused we come, the more depressed people become. Do you know, people that spend, the research came out a few months ago, people spend more time on Facebook and more depressed than others, whether that's social comparison or what. But I still think you need to get kids out and be out of themselves. Think about other people, step out. It's a great study I've talked about before by Swartz, Carol Swartz, had two groups of participants with multiple sclerosis. Now, multiple sclerosis is associated with high rates of depression, like as a regular thing. Group A had to call Group B to offer support. Group B had to do nothing. They just had to chill out and receive the phone support. How nice. So who do you think did better? Group A, who gave it, or Group B, who received it? A had no depression at the end of the study. Group B hadn't changed one bit. And that just that study, there, there would be, like Stephen Post's book, Why Good Things Happen to Good People. And if you just Google Stephen Post, he's awesome. Uh, he, has, he works at the Helping Institute in the United States. He got like, heaps of free articles and great stuff online. I could give you hundreds of articles like that. So push that into your as much as you can. Model this, look for opportunities, do um, random acts of kindness, and so on. It's got to be genuine. All right, next one. I'm not doing too bad. How are you going? You all right? You've had a long day at work, and then you've got to sit here and... Do you want more snacks? You can get more snacks. All right, boundaries. Fascinating that 16, 17, 18 year olds who were pretty rough, some of them, would actually say in my research that the one thing that made them feel valued was boundaries, like people putting rules in place. And I was like, every time one of the students told me, I was like, what, like really, are you telling me that you like, and they're like, oh, we're really mean about it at the time, like, but I knew that when my mum said, you can't do that, I knew she loved me. And one of the girls I interviewed, she said, I was self-harming, and my dad knew, and he did nothing about it, and I hate him. And I think, you know, boundaries, putting them in, you know, saying you need to stop, you can't do that. You get a negative response, and it's something we don't enjoy and you don't like. And, but I say to my students, when I put them in place, I said, it's because I care about you, I'm not going to let you hurt yourself. And then I've explained to them, and kids are so good at getting, I was like, you know gold? And they're like, yeah, you can do this. I say, I, everything for me is an analogy. I think I like stories. And so I said, you know how gold, would you go leave gold like just sitting on the cafeteria table? And they're like, no. And then I'm like, well, I said, I see you like gold. And so I sometimes put the gold in somewhere safe. I put it in somewhere that's protected. And that's when you get the rule is because I think you're like gold and I'm protecting you. And if I didn't care about you, I'd just leave you out the front on the ground. And they're like, ah. Oh. And then that when I put the thing in place, they're like, okay, like they changed the whole thing. Because I've told them the motivation for me protecting you, for putting that boundary in, is that I care about you. I was on the escalator at Maya the other last year, and you often see parents, don't you, where the least expected places. And this lady's like, Miss Jean, Miss Jean. I was like, hi. And she goes, my son, such and such, and I had your son like four years before that in year two. He, you were like his favourite teacher, and I was like, I only had him for math, like once a week, like when I was part time. And I told him off really bad, like not publicly, but he was really out of line one day. And he, she said he appreciated that. He he did so much better after that, and he just knew that you were trying to like protect him from. And I was just like, far out. You don't know what you've invested. You do it for the right reason, but putting those boundaries in really helps. Let's go the other way. And we put too many boundaries in. Have you heard the lawnmower one? That's one of my favourite ones. Lawnmower parents are the ones that go ahead of the kid and cut out any problems so they can just follow behind cruising like on their tricycle. So I don't want students like that and I'll tell my students that and I'll tell those students here this too. I want you to get a sickle and cut through the grass yourself because I want you to rely on yourself. And I want students to know that they can do it without me standing beside them. Which leads us on to coping. If your students think they can only do stuff if you're with them, you are doing them a disservice. My goal at the end of every year, whether I'm here in a school or a psych with somebody, is that you don't need me. 
I want you to rely on you and your circle of friends and not me as this awesome person who saved you. All right, so boundaries, you need to be okay with your decision. You need to know why you're doing it. And as a behavior management person, you need to decide ahead of time what they're going to be. Know what rules are going to be broken. Know what you're going to say and know what consequences you'll have. Because if you don't know those things, what you'll do is you'll come in harsh. The only time, if any of you have done this, I've done it. I've said things like, I'm going to keep you in for three weeks. You're the worst student I've ever seen. And then I'm like, oh, that means I have to stay in for three weeks as well. Like, but the reason I say that is because I had no plan. So have a plan. Because the other thing that happens when you do that is that you break relationship. And the one thing the kids said to me in the interviews, one of the many things they said to me, was that the only people that they would share stuff with when they weren't coping was people they had relationship with. So if you break relationship, it's all off. And, you know, I would do dumb things. I remember I told this kid off, and I was a bit harsh, year seven boy. And I went home, and you know what it's like? You like go over and over and over, and I was like, oh, this is the worst teacher ever. I'm so terrible. Why did I pick this career for? I should not be a teacher. I've ruined his life. He's never going to he's gonna end up in prison because of me. Like, you go on those. Go back to school the next day, hardly slept. I mean, it wasn't that bad, but I, I did it publicly, and I don't shame kids, like, ever. Put him aside before school, and I was like, hey, such and such, I'm really sorry about yesterday. That was just, I was out of line. You know, I really care about you. I just was stressed, and he said, and he goes, what happened yesterday? <laughs> I was like, hey, you could at least be a little scarred by it. So I told him what had happened yesterday, and he goes, that's all right, Machine. I know you care about me. And I was like, in the context of life, kids know there's ups and downs. If you're generally caring, kind, don't be hard on yourself when you make a mistake. You need to let that go as well. All right. Mastery, I could go on for half a day with you, but I won't. I'll just give you some three minor points. It's not about excellence. So one of the year seven groups I had as a teacher when I started with them, they were doing NAPLAN and they were all on a two or a three or a one. It was awesome. I thought, I'm going to do really well when they bring the results up this year. So because I was marking NAPLAN, I made up a student-centered rubric that they could actually track their own progress. So I had kids go from a zero for paragraphing and such to a five over the year because they made one step at a time and they knew what their next step was. But the beautiful part was there's a boy in my class who was quite um, well known. He's on Today Tonight for being so violent. He was like a zero on everything. I also had another boy who was like the top 1% in the state when uh, ATAR came out a couple of years ago. So quite a wide range of achievement. Those kids, though, when that boy who was like really struggling, they could not have high-fived him enough when he went up a level. And that's the beauty of a really safe classroom context. It's that it's not competition. It's your own with yourself. I'm just improving. And when I see that in place, and they're all happy for each other, wherever they're at, that's a really good place to be. You need to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to excel at what they are good at and at their own rate. And again, I could do like thousands of things on mastery, but I won't. Appreciate growth is one of the main things and not do it publicly. All right, existence, I need to go on to coping because I'm going to run out of time. Um, I actually, um, as I said, I go to church, I've gone to church since I was four, on and off. Existence was, they said God made them, they were born, all those sort of things. I took it out of the research because I thought maybe I'm being biased. And then when I ran the two focus groups, the kids all said to me, so I did two focus groups of eight, ten kids, they're like, oh, you're missing the bit about being born and God made me. And I was like, okay, so I'll put it all back in. So the thing is, you can't not be born. Oh, that would be very weird. You can't be here and then poof, you're gone. So it's stable. So again, it's a stable, unconditional thing. I was born, I must be born for a reason. So birthdays, remember people's birthdays. Uh, remember people's names. With my classes, I remember all their names within like a day or so because I know that their name, who they are, they were made is important and I, again it's genuine I'm not doing it to tick box because I heard someone say if you remember their name they like you more and you get better unit evaluations I'm like <laughs> or you remember the name because it actually makes them feel good maybe that's the reason you do it so um, existence and little things like when students used to come into my class um, 
it was all conditional. So, I, like, not intentional. I don't want you to get caught up on it. If you say nice things to your student, it's conditional, like, whatever. Like, so proud of you for your math test. Like, don't stress about that stuff. But just check yourself because I would say to them now, I'm so glad you're in my class. That's it, right? They did nothing to earn it. They do nothing to lose it. So that's what worth is that's a good worth. So they're not like, oh, you know, I've messed up. And like I say to them, yeah, you've messed up. And I remember having this conversation with this one boy who was really out of control. And I talked to him and I was like, yeah, you've messed up. Here's your discipline. This is what's going to happen. And he's like, but I said, I want you to know, though, I still care about you. And I'm still going to fight for you. And I'm still going to look after you. And he goes, how can you? I said, because I choose. I'm the adult, right? We're the adult here. We change their context by our choices. And we can't be reactive and going, well, they're rude, so I'm not, I'm not going to help them anymore. Or I'm not going to, you know, we don't change. If you want to make a difference in someone's life, you don't change. You continue to support them, encourage them, and so on. All right, once you have, see if I can do this last one page. I didn't even turn any of these on, did I? I did. All right. So once you have a good sense of worth, and then you've got all the skills, because every school has paid thousands of dollars to run all the packages, then what do we do then? All right, so this is where I think we fall into trouble. We feel like we're resilient, but we've actually had no problems going on. So I can say that I am a very patient person, and then when that car cuts me off, or does, oh, this car the other day, it was doing 60 in a 70 day zone, and then when we got to the 60 zone, it did 50. I was like, what's that about? So of course I had to overtake them at great speed. So we can say we are these things, but we actually aren't when we get put under pressure. So resilience is being put under pressure and then bringing it together. So coping in the face of that. So I want to talk about coping, um, and I'm going to... And I missed a section that I'll talk about later. Uh, 45 minutes. So coping, first of all, it involves feelings. Now, the problem with a lot of online stuff is that our feelings exist with us in our room alone. And that's a great concern to me. So if um, one of somebody comes across here and says, you're ugly, like I look at them, they look at me, I feel it, I'm like, oh, and then my friends might be with me and so on. But when I'm at home and I'm on my phone and someone's typing bad stuff about me, I'm alone processing my feelings bit risky for children. Feelings are good. Feelings are stuff that we've kind of got, again, sanitized the world a little bit. And we need to bring back in that feeling frustrated, feeling angry, feeling sad, they are good parts of life. And they're actually the things that teach us about life. And some of those times you will know as adults are actually some of the best times when we look back on it. They're hard times, but they're good times. You know who your friends are, you learn things. And they don't last forever. So kids need to know, number one, feelings don't last forever. Don't have to worry about a feeling being a bad feeling. I used to go, so I'd be like, let's just say Claire's upset. And she knows that she sits in the front row. She gets picked on too, so it's all good. <laughs> if Claire's upset, when I was teaching, I'd be like, all right, we need to talk about it now. And I don't, I'm not going to make you like own up if that's you. And they'd be like, I don't want to talk about it. I said, I want to talk about it now. Let's talk about it now. And they'd be like, no. And one thing I've learned from doing research, and Strobe and Shoot is a great bereavement model if you ever want to read about that, is that it takes us time to feel something, to feel the emotions. And the kids in my research said things like, I need to let all the emotions out before I can think. So I've learned to let people go. I will talk to you in half an hour. I'll talk to you in 15 minutes. Why does it have to be on my timeline? Let me know when you're ready to talk about it. It's okay that you're angry. It's okay that you're upset. And just validate it. It's not okay to go punch things and throw things around. I've never let that happen. But it's okay to feel it. So feelings are okay. Isn't that cute? That changed. I did not know that changed. That changed without me. Feelings are a sign to act. All right? Whatever it might be, you need to do something about it. But one thing I'm concerned about is feelings are not our guide. So what we do is we take feelings and we make them our tour guide. And we're like, you know, and I've done this the last four weeks. I've, gone, I've had lots of things going on and my feelings have made me make decisions. So I'm sad, so I'm going to not exercise today. You know, I'm just going to sit home and watch TV. 
or I'm angry so I'm not going to speak to you or I'm this you know like don't let your feelings dictate to you and again tell your young people this you need to go all right I'm okay to feel this this is telling me to do something but my feelings are not the boss of me my head is the boss of me I listen to them work out what they're telling me you're angry you're hurt you're upset but I'm going to actually make my own decision based on that so Imagine like you've got like a leash on and someone's dragging you, it's your feelings dragging you off. Don't let them do that. So we need problem solving. That is the absolute gold key for students once they're in this situation. And we often get in situations and we think that we should just know how to handle it. And when I see young people on Facebook or on whatever, I know they're not really on Facebook anymore, but I don't keep up with them enough and they get a response, they're actually not sure how to respond to something negative. And we need to discuss that, model that, because the same thing for you when you're in a situation you don't know, it's hard to know what to do. Now, people think that coping is this natural skill that you have or you don't have, but I want you to go back to the bucket. And it, it's the things that you've learned that you bring in, and sometimes I see kids and they just go, because that's in their bucket. And when they get into a situation, they're not actually sure there's nothing else in there to pick from that happened at their house that they could do. So they're both like, whoa, I just get really angry and that seems to work. And we have to keep thinking after the event, we need to talk to them and say, what else can we put in there that may be a little bit different? All right, what else? So many things here. What we need to do, I might go back a point too, is we need to make sure that students don't feel out of control. Now the concern I have with the internet and through the bullying and stuff that's going on, I don't love that word, is that there's a hopelessness associated with it. And so when someone's, you know, I want you to remember a system, a child is a very small part of a system and we get very child focused and it'll be like, if we teach them to be resilient, if we teach them social skills, if we, but a child is not strong enough to withstand a whole system. So we can teach them those things, but we need to change the system around them. We are responsible for that. You think about students that go from one class to the next and they're perfectly behaving and then they're not, and then they are and then they're not. Is the child changing or is the class changing? So we need to address the system. And again, I'm not saying the child's perfect, but we need to think broader. Coping skills, and people have asked me to be in their research. I'm like, no, like I'm not gonna just, I, I want them to cope, but I'm not gonna put the onus on young people that their coping skills should be better. Our system should be better for them to cope in. I don't mind teaching them coping skills if we're gonna provide a better system. So the hopelessness is something that you need to really crack, especially if you're in secondary. I mean, it's getting down to like nine-year-olds and eight-year-olds at the moment too. Anyway, make good connections with them. So one thing that they've started, and I saw it on the news actually um, last night, was anonymous reporting. There's a system that you can go on Sigma, is it? I should have written the name down. But anyway, it's anonymous reporting, and that's one of the fears that kids will be ostracised if they report. So they take a screenshot of what it is, sends it through, and then they've got evidence. I think it's a great system. Because well, the point I missed before was boundaries. In real life, if these guys had a fight, which I'm sure you would later outside, I can see it, they can see it, and there's consequences. So if one person you know, hits another person, there's a consequence to that. Or if they yell and they see crying, they see their face expression as a consequence. But with online stuff, there's no consequence. There's no apparent consequence to, this, to any child. So I think what we need to make sure we do is to, um, and I don't know if you followed all the stuff I was on the, talking about the GPS trackers, is that real life, give kids some freedom, but stay back and watch. Online, you should be in their back pocket. I don't think there's any time that you should not be in, and I would drop in and out of their, you know, I see teachers sitting there with the lap, kids' laptops up and they're bullying the kid behind them with what's on the screen. So if you want laptops up, then you know, go stand behind them or laptops down while you're talking. They, because of the lack of relationship, the consequences, it's not gonna work. You need to make sure that you put that in. All right, so 
young people are looking for feedback. They want to feel valuable. They want to feel worthwhile. They're looking for some of them in the wrong places. It's an easy fix getting the like, getting that. But it's a very fragile system that we don't want them to engage in. They're looking in the wrong places. And the last thing I was thinking was just about how we get offended so easy. And, you know, like coping, part of coping is not being offended. And so people will call me into schools to deal with a bullying problem. And what happens is the student just said, I don't like their shirt. I'm like, wow, that's a pretty severe problem. So that child's saying, well, I'm not coping. I'm not resilient because they're so like, you know, it's so toxic. And I'm like, no, you like need to step up a bit. You need to not take offense. But if you go back to what I was saying earlier about worth, what's their worth based on? So it's fragile, right? And so I, I really think a fragile worth is easily broken. So if you're basing your worth on stuff that's really breakable, so you could say just about anything to me, and I'm good, because I know I've got this awesome mother who is amazingly unconditional. I've got great family. I love purpose. I love helping people. I know I was born for a reason. I have all my things... I have a nice spread of things that I rely on. And you know what? It's not that I don't dip and go, oh, I have really bad days, don't I? I do have bad days, yeah. I do not have bad days, but I don't stay there. And I step up, I deal with it. And, you know, you can drop those on them, the tools and beliefs and challenge. And I say to them, like, I'd be like, who's good at math here? Or who thinks they're awesome? And they'll be like, and I was like, I think you're awesome. And I say to them, do you know what? This year you're in Miss Sheen's class. And even though you were never good at math, you might have got in trouble all the time, it's a new year this year. And I'm going to find every good thing about you that I can find, and it will be different. And it is. And that's it. Thank you. I did leave half the PowerPoint off, but it was pretty dumb. Maybe. Thank you. Pleasure. We have time for questions, so would somebody like to go first and ask a question of Mandy? Down the back. Hey. Um, the school? Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Mm. No, and I think we're all kind of like I love. I've got three computers, two. I I've got everything, and I love technology. But I think we're in this little space at the moment where we think things are better if we have technology, and it's not true. Technology is a tool we use to make us do better stuff. I had a year two class that I had on Fridays a few, about five years ago. They all played on the computers in the morning and I hate it. I think you should be socializing, you should be playing with blocks. So I said to them, no computers, and oh my goodness, did they like cry, like that was so sad. And I was like, I don't care. And they just, half the, they just stood there. Like, I don't really, I don't know. I said, there's blocks, there's dress up. About five weeks later, I was like, all right, you can put the computer on for like, and like I had to put, see that's the thing with boundaries. I had to put up with that. That was annoying, and they're little too. And then five weeks later, I'm like, oh, you know, if you want to play on the computers, you can. They're like, oh, my goodness, no, we've got this tower machine. Look at this tower. And so I think we need some guts to step out and say, no, you can't have it. No, it's, it's not for now. And, and, but love the tool at the same time. Yeah. Few fine motor skills might be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I always, in my head, I always think, no matter what I'm doing, what is the best long-term outcome for this child? Not 
what's easiest, what's funnest, what's, you know, sometimes on Friday what's funnest is, that's usually for me. But yeah, long term, what, what do I need to do for this kid? Another question? Well, I moved. Not an option. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for being a good audience. Okay, thank you. Thank you.